Welcome to the wonderful vistas of the South Downs near Worthing. Little would you suspect that amongst these wildflowers and grasses, just in front of me, hidden behind the trees, is a treasure of a garden, high down gardens. So let's go and have a look. The garden was created from 1909 by Sir Frederick Stern and his wife Sybil as a private garden around their home, High Down Towers. Frederick is described as big game hunter, merchant banker, soldier, botanist and gardener. Since Frederick's death in 1967 at the age of 83, the garden has been in the hands of Worthing Borough Council at his request. It is now tended by a team of five and is free for the public to enjoy. It is a wonderful garden, divided into many different gardens, nooks and crannies, open spaces. You feel as if you are in someone's private garden, and you are really. And it has a fascinating story that takes us into the world of plant hunters and the earliest days of experimenting with growing plants on chalk. These wonderful lush gardens are miraculously created in the unpromising conditions of an old chalk pit. This chalk pit was used to get lime for the surrounding fields. It seems an odd place to start a garden, almost no soil and a cliff of chalky rock. But as is often the case, it all really happened by accident. The space was being used by the Stearns as a place to keep pigs, chickens and refuse. But they wanted to build a tennis court. So they built the court in the base and soon decided that pigs and refuse were not great surroundings for tennis. So they decided to grow flowering shrubs and move the livestock elsewhere. The nearby cave pond was created when they moved the old pigsty and found a lime kiln at the back. So they covered the walls with Horsham stone to make it look like a cave and built a cement lined pond in front, which then, as now, is home to water lilies and a great number of fish. Round the pond, they built a rock garden, which was finished in 1910. It is here that you can find a small stone with the only acknowledgement in the garden that it was built by the Stearns. The pond was so successful that in 1910, they also cemented the seasonal pond in the chalk pit to make it a permanent feature and planted more water lilies and the bamboo Arundinaria nitida. They also built a south-facing rock garden beneath the cliff and in the following years added more plants to that section of the pit. The plants lower down in the chalk pit were top-fed with leaf manure and mushroom compost. In his typically understated way, Stern in his book, A Chalk Garden, says, It is surprising how the trees and shrubs grow on the steep chalk cliff, where it is impossible to manure or top dress them, and that once the shrubs begin to cover the cliff, self-sown seedlings plant themselves, among them especially evergreen oaks, laburnums and cotoneasters. It is not possible to water the plants on the cliff, but it seems that water from the downs percolates through the cliff and the chalk holds the moisture rather like a sponge. He also adds, the cliff gardening is none too easy and is known in the garden as commando gardening because the younger gardeners were apparently lowered down on ropes from the cliff top to plant and tend. The garden was created at a time when there were lots of plant hunters coming back from places like China, Japan and Korea with wonderful new seeds and plant species and this garden was very much influenced by those. This avenue of Prunus cerula or the Himalayan birch bark cherry tree is a wonderful example of these Himalayan trees and the story goes that the undergardeners were paid to polish them at least once a week. This bounty of new plants from overseas was what encouraged the Stearns to create the gardens in the south of the chalk pit, from what had once been a paddock. And this lower garden was extended with land bought from a nearby farmer who said it was worthless for crops. But the Stearns didn't just stay at home and receive plants and seeds, they also travelled extensively and did some of their own plant hunting and collecting, particularly in the middle Atlas Mountains in North Africa, from where they brought back Paeonia coriacea, amongst other seeds. 
In the centre of the site, they've created a lovely rose garden. It's perfectly situated because it's protected by the chalk cliffs and its own hedges. The roses are mostly old roses, underplanted with geraniums, and the edges of the beds have this wonderful lavender, which at the moment is covered in bees and butterflies, and the whole place smells heavenly. As the Stearns became more and more experienced, they, with their trusty head gardeners, Mr. Buckman and later Mr. Bassendale, experimented very successfully with propagation and hybridization. Rosa hydaunensis and Wedding Day are two of their most famous roses. They also developed hybrids of Eremurus, peonies, daffodils, snowdrops, irises and lilies to find and develop those that would thrive best on chalk. Many of their plants are still available and some even bear their or the garden's name. High Down is best known for its early season flowers, but the Stearns endeavour to have colour and scent year round as flowers or berries or in changing tree shades. So as a test, we filmed in August, often a difficult month for flower gardens, being that it's after the first flush of roses and before the autumn plants really put on a good show. And to our delight, we found water lilies, lavender, geraniums, oriental lilies, roses, hemorrhocalis, scabious, anemones, buddleia and hollyhocks, all in flower and covered in bees and butterflies. In the lower gardens, there are also sweet-smelling clerodendron and eryngium, and the original Acer grissium planted in 1912 with its fabulous peeling bark. If you visit the gardens as a plant lover, your only major disappointment is likely to be that very few of the plants are named, so it's hard to find the original gems from the early years. This is apparently because when they were named, people came to take cuttings of the rare plants and even dug up many of the rare snowdrops. It's a tragedy, as now sadly, though you are allowed to wander anywhere with a map, it only features 12 of the many hundreds of interesting plants. But it is a garden well worth visiting. It is probably the first example of a major garden in the UK built on chalk, and it has a fabulous array of plants at any time of the year. Filming in August just made us think we had to be there too in January, February, March, 